so our next speaker this morning is Dr. Michael Jaff. Dr. Michael Jaff happens to be the chair of a newly formed institute here at Mass General Hospital, the Heart, Stroke, and Vascular Institute. He's also the chair of our vascular center here. So Mass General is a pretty big place, right? You all know that, I'm sure. And to have three major departments come together under one leader is really quite a significant accomplishment. And it shows how skilled and accomplished one is. But it, when you really think about it, if we bring all the experts together around heart disease, vascular disease, and stroke, this is all, this encompasses the patients that have blood clotting problems. So it's really great to put all the experts together in order to develop the best means possible to take care of patients with these problems. And, um, and, and we're delighted because Dr. Jeff loves having time to spend with patients. So um, we're really, I'm really grateful that he, he made time out of his busy administrative schedule with all he has to do with the Institute and is here this morning with us to share what he will tell us about um, treating and preventing blood clots. So please join me in welcoming Michael Jaff. Thank you, Lynn. Good morning, everyone. Everybody wiggling their ankles and squeezing their calves. Yeah, right, I got it. I understand. So uh, just to give you some perspective as a, as a doc, um, I speak a lot to doctors, too. And I quote Dr. Ansel all the time and Dr. Raskob. So for me, this is like a kid in a candy store to be on the same, in the same room in the same panel as them. So I want to just take one second to thank Dr. Ansel again for a really superb presentation. Um, and I, like Dr. Ansel, also love much more speaking to patients than doctors. And I'll give you an example of why that is. When, when we speak to doctors, there's inevitably somebody in the audience who wants to make the speaker look bad. Uh, almost all. Am I right? I mean, it's just, it's just the way it is, right? So I have a friend who um, did some scientific study several years ago and discovered something really important and uh, was asked to travel around the United States to talk about his findings and the impact of his research on healthcare. It got crazy. I mean, he was asked like every week to go two or three times to different cities and travel all over from large metropolitan areas to little small towns to the point where he couldn't manage his schedule. It got too confusing. So he hired someone to uh, do his scheduling for him. So, make sure that he was on the right plane, um, got to the right airport, had a hotel room to stay in that night, was able to get back to the airport for the next place. And this went on for weeks. And everything was working perfectly. And every time he would go and he'd give this talk, it'd be exactly the same talk, right? Same 40 slides. And the lights would come up, and there'd be the doctors, and someone always would try and peg him with some difficult question, and he'd handle it perfectly. And it was always the same questions. So about six months into this, uh, my friend gets off the airplane. His, his assistant is there with a the car. They're driving to the next venue to give the talk. And uh, the doctor says to the, his colleague, uh, you know, this has been six months, two or three times a week. I am just sick of this. You know, you've been watching me do this now for six months, two or three times a week. I bet you could give the same talk, same way I do it. And so the driver goes, yeah, I really think I know this cold. I know exactly when to advance the next slide. I've heard every question answered. And so my friend says, well, let's do something. No one here knows me. <laughs> when we get to the hotel, let's go into the men's room. We'll switch clothing. I'll put on the driver's clothing. You put on my suit. And you give the talk. And I'll just sit in the back and have a beer and relax. The driver goes, that sounds great. I can definitely do this. So they get to the men's room. They switch clothes real fast. In walks the doctor dressed as the driver, goes into the back. And uh, the driver gets up, gets introduced, and gives an absolutely flawless presentation. Every slide perfect. Everything went great. Lights come up. Doctors start asking questions. Everyone that this driver had heard over and over again nailed them all perfectly except that one doctor who stands up and says, you know, doctor, I read that paper you published in the New England Journal of Medicine really carefully. 
And I think there's a really serious mistake that you made in your statistics that completely invalidates the science. No one had ever asked this question before. Holy moly. Can you imagine? So the driver's up there and he's thinking, if I blow this, I ruin this guy's career, right? I mean, all the work that he's done. So he scratches his chin and he goes, you know, doctor, that question is so easy, I'm going to ask the driver in the back of the audience to answer it. <laughs> so, so that's the reason we're much happier speaking to uh, the public, because you folks are here to learn. You've got experience. Um, and so my job this morning is just to give you a little background on, on how to prevent and treat blood clots. You already heard all about the risk factors. That's the way to prevent them, to know. Knowledge is power in this area, and when you know what the risk factors are, or your neighbors or your neighbor's doctors know the risk factors, they can be very proactive. So that, for example, someone who's got multiple risk factors and has had blood clots in the past, and maybe one copy of that gene for factor V Leiden who's about to fly to Australia, I suspect that Dr. Ansel and I would give you something more than just wear stockings to prevent your risk, right? So it's knowledge that tells it. But I'm also going to talk about um, how to treat these. Now, I don't have the time to go through this in great detail. You're not going to be able to give a lecture about treatment after we're done. But I think you'll get a perspective on the standard treatment and what's coming, what's new, what's exciting in this area, which, frankly, five years ago, we were only able, able to talk about kind of hypothetically. So it's exciting that there are new things that can be used. So you already heard about this. And, and by the way, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, actually take some time to show you some of my patients. Because I think the best way to learn about how this stuff can happen is to see what other people have gone through. Uh, so these are the two big consequences of uh, blood clots. This is what we all worry about. The one on your left is a CAT scan. And it shows, um, this a, shows a big blood clot here. We call this a saddle blood clot because it kind of crosses over to the right and left. So that's that stripe right there. We worry about that. And this is one thing that may not kill you, but it certainly impacts on your quality of life. And that's an ulcer due to chronic leg swelling that can occur after a blood clot. And what this does is it makes you go back to the doctor a lot more often. You have to wear uh, bandages and get them changed all the time. It can be really uncomfortable. And remember that blood clots can affect anyone and everyone at any age, in any walk of life. This just shows you, you don't have to be a scientist, these are the years, this is the expected increased risk of blood clotting over time. This is the real deal, folks. We're not, we're not tailing off. This problem's going to be around. It's going to be around for a long time. And there's a lot of misperceptions out there about blood clots and what they do. How many of you remember Zsa Zsa Gabor, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I certainly remember her. But you want to see, this is a press release that was put out about Zsa Zsa Gabor. And what it says here is that she was admitted to a hospital in Los Angeles for the treatment of swelling in her legs. That's not why she was admitted. And it says here that she had massive blood clots in her legs, which could make her vulnerable to a heart attack. So the perspective here was that Zsa Zsa Gabor was admitted to the hospital for a heart attack. That's not true. Zsa Zsa Gabor had a hip fracture, had her hip fixed, and developed blood clots in her legs and had a pulmonary embolus or a blood clot to the lungs, not a heart attack. As Dr. Ansel said, lots of misperceptions when people call something something that it's not the case of. Think about the healthiest person you could imagine who never in your wildest dreams could end up with a blood clot. How about Serena Williams? Could you imagine? Had a big time blood clot to her lungs. How could she get one? This is all over the press. Even our local mayor, Tom Menino, right? Bunch of medical problems, you all know. He was in the hospital at the Brigham for a long time uh, earlier in the year and last fall. And he had a blood clot that traveled from his leg to his lung. So it doesn't matter how healthy you are. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter what status you have in the community. This is a non-discriminatory disorder. Now, there's this guy 
back in the 1970s named Rudolf Virchow. And if you think about it, in the, I'm sorry, it's the 1970s, please. How about the 1700s? Uh, who came up with the reason why people get blood clots in veins. And they came out with three components. Part of this you already heard about earlier today. Slow blood flow. Vein blood flow is not as fast as artery blood flow. So the blood kind of it takes its time getting out of the veins. Some sort of damage to the inner lining of the vein, irritation injury, that can be from a fracture. It can be from a cast. It can be from a prior blood clot or a burn. Any of that stuff can be the second component. And then the third one is thick blood. You heard a great deal about the proteins in the blood that make your blood thick, but there are other things that can do it, like pregnancy that thicken the blood. You take these three things, you put them together, the risk of getting a blood clot goes up. So how do we prevent blood clots? Well, you're, again, I would stick with what you just heard. I don't have to spend any time on this. We divide patients' risk into low, moderate, high, and very high risk, all due to the factors that Dr. Ansel mentioned. Age, body weight, underlying health, activity level. Those kinds of things increase the risk. And when you add up risk factors, the risk goes up. So for example, if you're having a uh, hip fracture replacement in a, an 85-year-old person who fell and broke a hip, who also, by the way, is being treated for cancer, you start adding up these risks, that, that person's a setup for a vein blood clot. But if you take a 35 or a 40-year-old person who needs to have their gallbladder taken out and it's done through a scope and they go home either later that day or the next morning and they have no other medical history, well, that person's risk is significantly lower. It doesn't mean they can't get one, but the odds are much lower than the person who had surgery for a hip fracture while they're 85 and being treated for cancer. And of course, also as you heard, you always weigh the risk of clotting to the risk of bleeding. Just like Dr. Ansel said, if the risk of bleeding is really high, someone's got a history of an active ulcer in the stomach and actually bled from that ulcer, and now they're going to go and have um, uh, a bunion repaired, we're going to be preventing that blood clot in a much different way than we would in someone who's never had a bleeding event um, has had a previous blood clot five years ago and is now going to get on a plane to go to Australia, right? It's all weighing the risks of clotting to the risks of bleeding. It is not always clear. It, there's not always a right and wrong. The flip of the coin is actually often how the discussion goes. Many times you'll say to me, well, what would you do if it were you, doc, or your wife or your mother? And the first thing I'll say is, well, you presume I love my mother, right? Because, you know, if it's, uh, yeah. but um, it's not always black and white. And it really does require that discussion of risks of bleeding or clotting with the patient and the doctor. One thing that we like to do is do things that cause no harm, that offer potential benefit, right? If it doesn't cause any harm and can offer help, why not give it a try? So if you're going to have an operation, and I'm worried about bleeding, and I want to lower your risk of blood clots, I can use something like this. This is a thing that wraps around your leg. How many of you have been in the hospital and have had surgery and you had one of these things on your calf that, yeah, right? I mean, it's not a miserable thing. It's a little inconvenient, but in the scope of things, it's a lot worse than getting, a, a lot better than getting a blood clot. What this thing does is it rhythmically compresses and releases, and it forces that vein blood out of your leg, makes the blood flow faster and more repeatedly. And so it lowers the incidence of blood clots. And in some situations, this is all we have to do. In others, this is one component of what we do. But the nice thing about this is, it really doesn't increase your risk of anything, and yet it could lower your risk of a blood clot. So there are lots of recommendations out there, lots of scores. Again, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you can see here that we increase what we do based on what our view is your risk of having a clot is. So if we think your risk is extraordinarily low, extraordinarily low, we might tell you that don't do anything specific except get out of bed quickly. So that person who gets the 
laparoscopic gallbladder removal, we just tell them, get up and out of bed quickly, period. That's all you need to do. But in someone who's had a hip fracture and is older and is not mobile and has cancer, we're going to really think about using one of those compression pumps, putting on a compression stocking, and giving shots of some medication or a pill blood thinner. So you see what I mean? You take the number of risks, you add them up, and as the risk goes up, you jack up what you use to prevent blood clots. Now, that's the prevention part. If you are not lucky enough to have prevented it, and now you have one, what do we do? So there are a whole bunch of guidelines out there. When I was in training, this was all we did. IV heparin. Come into the hospital, they put an IV in the vein in your arm, and they put this bag of heparin, and it runs through you 24 hours a day. And every six hours, you get a blood test, and it tells us whether the heparin's at the right dose. In other words, is your blood thinned appropriately, but not too thin that you could bleed? This is still widely accepted as a very effective way to treat blood clots. And remember, our goal for treating the blood clot you have is to make sure you don't get another blood clot. That's the goal. In the short term, that's a high, high risk situation. If you have a blood clot in the middle of your thigh, in a deep vein in the middle of your thigh, and you don't do anything about it, there's a 50-50 chance, not a one in a thousand chance, a one in two chance that that blood clot's gonna travel up your leg, break off, and go to the heart and the lungs. So we gotta do something right away. This is one way to do it. It's really not convenient, right? I mean, first of all, who wants to be in a hospital for five to seven days tethered to an IV? It's not, but this works. What you're probably more used to are these types of shots of medicines called low molecular weight heparins. Just an example of advances of medical science. It's the same type of treatment, but now you don't have to be tied to an IV, and you don't have to be laying in a hospital bed. Those are all good. So you take shots of this medication, and it thins your blood, and it works. And many times we use these shots in different doses for people who are getting on planes going to Australia. So it's not infrequent that I'll say to my high-risk patients, I want you to take a shot of this in the restroom an hour before you get on the plane. So these medications work, and they're far more convenient. Now there's another one, also by injection, that works a different way. So the mechanism whereby it prevents blood clots from getting worse is different, but it does the same, it accomplishes the same goal. It lowers the risk of new blood, blood clots from forming. It's called Fonda Paranux or Erixtra. And the nice thing about this one is that it's got a longer half-life. It means it stays around longer. So you only have to use it once a day as compared to twice a day. Um, that could be a downside, too. If you have a really long half-life and you start bleeding, you got to worry about its effects longer. So again, these are kind of the risk of clotting versus risk of bleeding story that you keep hearing me talk about. And then, of course, good old Coumadin. We already heard the questions about what other side effects can occur with Coumadin. I can tell you I've never been in Coumadin, and uh, you can see a little bit of hair loss there. Um, here's the issue with Coumadin. Word to the wise. It does take five days for Coumadin to actually prevent new blood clots from forming. So during those five days, you're not protected if you have a new blood clot. You can't just start Coumadin alone if you have a new blood clot. That's why your doctor uses a shot of one of those other medications while you're taking Coumadin, just to get you started, right? And once the blood test shows that the Coumadin's where it needs to be, it's at the right dose, that INR test, that says that it's right where it needs to be, that's when you can stop the shots. Usually you got to overlap them for four or five days. And that's an important word to the wise. So if you uh, or someone you love is diagnosed with a new vein blood clot in a leg or the lung, and someone says, just take this prescription for Coumadin, you know it's time to ring that wait a minute whistle. Because uh, that's not necessarily right. Now here's, here's something that any of you have ever, how many of you have ever taken Coumadin before? So you know better than me. This is not a fun medication to take, right? You've got to think about everything you do 
when you're taking Coumadin every day. Like when you go to the local pharmacy to buy something for a cough or a cold, you got to think, is there something in that over-the-counter cough or cold medicine that could interfere or make my risks of bleeding on Coumadin worse? Or if you go to an urgent care center for a productive cough and they say you have bronchitis, here's an antibiotic, your bell needs to go off in your head and remember that you read that book when you started Coumadin that says don't take any prescription medications until you tell your doctor that you're on Coumadin. Because so many medications interact with Coumadin in a way you wouldn't want it to. Some of them make your blood thicker so your clot risk goes up. Some of them make your blood thinner so your bleeding risk goes up. It's an entirely sensitive interaction that you need to be aware of. You don't have to know all the names of the medications that interact. In fact, I have to look them up because there are so many that interact with Coumadin. You just have to know no new medication, either over the counter or by prescription until you check with the person who's giving you your Coumadin. So here, for example, the anticoagulation management service is a phenomenal resource. And if you get told by somebody outside of here that you need a new something, call them and say, is it OK for me to take? Or do I have to adjust my Coumadin dose or get my INR checked a little sooner? It's pretty simple to do. There are so many issues with this medication. I mean, I could spend the whole hour just talking about how many problems there are. You got to watch what you eat. You have to be consistent on your diet. You have to be careful about alcohol. These are all factors that play, play a role. And no matter how compliant you are, no matter how good you are about taking it at 6 o'clock every evening like they told me to do, there is an unpredictable response to this medicine. You could be perfectly stable on Coumadin for months at a time, and all of a sudden, your test comes back with an INR of 4 and a half. Right? And you say, I didn't do anything different. And someone like me says, come on, level with me. What, what did you, Doc, I swear I didn't. It's not that you did anything different. It's a crazy drug, period. It's a crazy drug. So you got to be careful with this. Now, just to show you that it's not you, when you look at medical studies that have compared Coumadin dosing to other treatments, where the goal of treatment was to keep that INR between 2 and 3, in the best of medical studies, where the results are always better than outside of medical studies, they just always are, only 66% of the time is the INR where it's supposed to be. That's in the best of situations. That's kind of unbelievable. But in the real world, it can be as low as less than half the time. So it's not you. It's the drug. It's a crazy drug, period. So what's new? Well, there's this whole new class of things called novel. Novel meaning kind of cool. Oral meaning you take them by mouth. That's a good thing. No needles. As my kids say, anything without a needle is a good thing. And anticoagulants, blood thinners. They call them novel oral anticoagulants, or NOACs. That's kind of the buzz phrase for this. Here's the beauty of this. Check this out. Someone gets diagnosed today with a new blood clot in a vein in a leg. And I decide that I don't need to give them a shot. I don't need to put them in the hospital. I give them a pill. And from the day they take that pill, they're protected. Sounds almost too good to be true, right? No needles, no overlap, no recurrent blood tests in the first few days, no laying in a hospital bed. It's unbelievable. There are several of these. Some of these are available in the United States for the treatment and prevention of blood clots in people with irregular heart rhythms. And I'm not going to talk about that at all today. But there's one medication that's approved by the Food and Drug Administration to use in the United States for the treatment of new blood clots in the veins and the legs and even new blood clots in the veins and the lungs. That's this one, Rivaroxaban, approved in the United States. So here's what we're going to show you. This is a medication that's actually available in the United States, but not for vein blood clots, for that heart rhythm issue. And you don't have to be a scientist to be able to tell that if I show you that the red line is Coumadin 
and the blue line's this new drug, and we're looking at the risk of blood clots. Look at that. They're identical. That tells you that this pill is just as effective as Coumadin. But we always say, well, what about the bleeding risk? Well, check this out. This is looking at any bleeding, Coumadin and this new medication. And notice here that there's actually lower bleeding risk with the new medication than Coumadin. So it's just as effective in preventing blood clots with lower bleeding risk. Well, that sounds pretty good, right? But let's get to what's available in the United States. This was a press release that came out by the Food and Drug Administration. That's got to be pretty important. November 2nd, 2012, so almost a year ago, saying that they are now approving this drug, Rivaroxaban, to treat blood clots in the veins and the legs or the lungs. Why did they do this? They did it because of two big-time trials. They were called the Einstein studies. Pretty smart people who were involved in this, obviously. Maybe a little arrogant, but. Um, uh, so this is one looking at this pill for the treatment of vein blood clots. And again, I'm just going to show you the standard way to take care of it is the shot of Lovenox, right? And the Coumadin overlap, and then you continue the Coumadin, right? That you guys have done that. This is that treatment. This is the pill alone. No shots, no IVs, just the pill. And we're looking at the event rate of new blood clots forming over the course of a year. There actually were fewer blood clots in the new drug treatment that didn't require a shot, didn't require an IV, didn't require a hospitalization. And this is actually looking at after you completed six months of treatment with either the new pill or Coumadin and you stopped the medication because you completed six months of treatment and then they randomized again by chance half of those patients to the medication and half those patients to a sugar pill that had no activity, look at the long-term reduction in risk over the next year of new blood clots, dramatically lower with the new medication. It's why Dr. Ansel said that all things being equal in people who have blood clots, particularly if we don't know why they had them, we like to treat them longer. Because look at this risk of getting another blood clot in the first year after you completed treatment compared to if you're on this medication. But again, you appropriately would say, well, this sounds too good to be true. I bet you there's more bleeding with this new medicine. Not so. This is the combination, right? Shots of Lovenox with warfarin compared to Rivaroxaban. No difference in bleeding. So more effective in preventing blood clots in the early stage, much more effective than preventing new blood clots a year after you complete therapy than no treatment, and similar bleeding risk. So you say, OK, Dr. Jaff, you took the easy way out. That's vein blood clots in the legs. What about in the lungs? Same story. This is the pill versus however you want to treat a blood clot in the lungs, either through an IV, heparin with Coumadin, or a shots of Lovenox with Coumadin. Similar event rates, recurrent blood clots. Similar bleeding risk. This data is really good. Thousands of patients randomized, multiple centers all over the place, highest levels of science. Major bleeding actually occurred less often with the new pill than standard therapy, statistically lower. So I think this is a game changer, folks. First time in 60 years we have something to talk about other than Coumadin. Now, there's got to be a hitch, right? In medicine, nothing's 100%. No way. That's why we can't list every risk factor. We can't say every problem that can occur. What's the hitch? So the benefits of this medication, wide therapeutic margin means you only take this pill once a day. You don't have to do it more often. There are very few food and drug interactions. So although there are some drug interactions, they're very uncommon. They're not usually with medications that you take regularly. 
And the food interactions are even less common. So all that stuff about green leafy vegetables and liver and all that stuff, you don't have to worry about with this. I know, see, it's unbelievable. But look at this one. You don't have to go get INR tests. See, I'm telling you, I, she needs to be on my corner right here. She's, she's just gasping with excitement over this. It's phenomenal. You don't have to go and get INR tests. This dose is so predictable in thousands and thousands of patients tested that we know it thins the blood. These are huge changes in quality of life for our patients. But where's the downside? We can't monitor whether you're on exactly the right amount or not. Now, most of the time it works perfectly, but nothing in medicine's 100%. It's very hard right now to measure the impact of this medication on blood thinning, okay? It's not like I just send you to the lab to get an INR and I know, or stick your finger, and I know in a matter of seconds where your blood thinning is. We don't actually have this INR of two to three with this new medication. There is no such thing. Here's the big one. If God forbid you're on Coumadin and you come into Dr. Ansel or me in our emergency room and you're bleeding, we can reverse the effects of Coumadin literally within an hour. You're out of trouble. That is not the case with these medications. We don't have a rapidly effective therapy to reverse the impact of these medications. So that's worrisome, right? If you start bleeding and you're on one of these, it's a concern. Now, we, we think we know what to do in the event that this happens. There are, it's not like we're going to stand there and say, sorry, you're out of luck. There's nothing we can do. I mean, there are things we do. It's just not as reliable as we know what to do with Coumadin. Now, the good news is just this past week, there's an antidote that's been going through phase two trials in the, in the United States that's actually performing very well. And I suspect within the next couple of years, that'll be available in the United States. It is available overseas. So the hope for this is going to change. It's going to come around. But right now, today, that antidote's not available. So management of bleeding is a, is a problem. And of course, we've been using Coumadin now for 60 plus years. We know exactly everything about that medicine there is to know. These medicines, not the case, right? They're just out in use over the past several years around the world and within the last year here. And then the last piece of bad news. Sorry, guys. How much is generic Coumadin? I mean, it's pennies on the dollar. It's one of the cheapest medications we prescribe. This one, big time, big time expensive. Hundreds of times the cost of Coumadin. Now, when it first came out late last year, many private insurance plans would not cover this. So we couldn't use it just because the, I mean, it's hard to pay for it out of your pocket. A lot of plans over the past six to eight months have started to accept this. So if God forbid you need this or you're gonna talk to your doctor about it, just call your insurance plan and ask them. It's becoming much more approved by uh, plans because of the reasons that I've shown you. So. Here's my, here's my kind of simple endpoint for this. Why should a patient not switch from Coumadin today? You've been on Coumadin a long time, you're doing fine. Why should you not switch to this new medication? Here's my gestalt. You tell me which one of these is true, based on what I told you. This is a, this is a multiple choice question. Warfarin's easier to take, is that true or false? False, right? I told you it's miserable to take. So that's not the right answer. Rivaroxaban is more expensive, right? I told you it's a lot more expensive, but that's not a reason to switch. It's easier to reverse the effects of rivaroxaban than warfarin. That's false, right? I told you we don't know yet how to reverse this. There are more food and drug interactions with rivaroxaban than warfarin. That's not true. And warfarin's more effective in preventing blood clots than rivaroxaban. That's also not true. So this is the reason you shouldn't switch for sure. It is so much more expensive that if you're doing fine on Coumadin and you've got your life together on it, it's not worth the cost, I don't think, until the cost starts coming down. So here's my personal view. And I, if I see somebody with DVT and I'm thinking about rivaroxaban versus my usual way, this is why I wouldn't just put somebody on rivaroxaban. A big blood clot in the leg or a blood clot up into the pelvis 
I'm going to bring him in the hospital, see how things are going. I'm not just going to send somebody home. We don't really know how effective this medication is in people with cancer or cancer in chemotherapy. It's probably okay, but we don't know. I know exactly how to take care of people with cancer-related blood clots. I don't use warfarin in those people either. I use one of these other injectable medications. So I'm not switching yet on that. And all sorts of other things, like kidney problems. If you have kidney problems, this particular medication is metabolized largely through the kidneys. So it can cause a real problem. You can end up with too much rivaroxaban and more bleeding. So I don't use it in people like that. Same thing for pulmonary embolus. If somebody is really sick, very short of breath, their blood pressure is a little low, I've got to have them on oxygen, I'm not just going to give them the pill. I'm going to bring them in the hospital. I'm going to make sure I know what I'm doing. I'm going to make sure they're doing well. I'm not just going to give them a pill and send them home. Same thing for all these other reasons. Now, how long should you be on blood, blood thinners? Somebody said uh, you've got to be on it for life. How do, how do we make that judgment? So here's kind of a clue. Here's a clue. Dr. Ansel uh, allu alluded to this before. If this is the first blood clot you ever had, and it's due to something we know causes blood clots, that's a short-term treatment. You have a knee replacement. You get a blood clot in a vein and a calf. I'm not leaving you on blood thinners for life. I know why you got it. That's a three-month treatment, and you're off to the races. If it's a recurrent, your second blood clot or more, or it happens and I can't explain why. So not throwing the medicine ball, uh, not having cancer. You know, you just come in out of the blue healthy, no air travel, nothing, and you've got a blood clot to the lung, I'm going to treat you for longer, at least six months. And I always talk about the need for indefinite or prolonged treatment. If you have cancer-related blood clots, first of all, I don't start with Coumadin. It doesn't really work. And I usually treat with one of these injectable medications until their cancer is controlled. So until they're in remission. And I'm happy with how things are going. I'm a big fan of compression stockings. They actually look a lot nicer now than they used to. A couple of words about IVC filters. Anybody here have an IVC filter? That's a big metal screen that's put in the vein in your belly to prevent the blood clot from the leg getting to the lungs couple of people. Some of you must have heard about this. If you've had blood clots, someone said to you somewhere along the way, well, we could put a filter in. Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. OK. Oh, it's not the coffee filter. It's not, that's not what I meant. Look, the bottom line with filters is it's this screen that's placed through a small needle puncture in the vein in the groin that catches a blood clot when it breaks off from the leg and traps it so it doesn't make it to the lungs. You do this in a situation where either you can't give blood thinners for other reasons, or you're worried so much about this breaking off and going to the lungs. And the good news is that most patients with blood clots to the lungs really do very well. It's a very, very small percentage of people that are looking very sick at the time that they present. These are what these things look like. You can see they're wild designs. Look at this thing. Someone was drunk at night and just drew this thing on a piece of paper, and the next thing you know, it's made in a medical device. These have been around for, for a long time. But these are the new ones. Now, they don't, might not look different from you, except look at this little hook at the top. See that? These come out. So the cool thing about the new ones is, in the past, when we would put these filters in, it was with you forever. Couldn't come out. Now, if you are... Someone you know is riding a motorcycle. God forbid they get in an accident and they have closed head trauma. That's a very high risk situation for blood clots, but only for a short period of time till they recover from their injury. You put in one of these retrievable filters for a week, the patient's awake and alert, moving around, you pull it out. It's a great thing, right? So when do we put in these filters? We put them in when you cannot get thin with, when you can't take blood thinners. So, Someone comes in with a blood clot to the lungs, and two days ago, they had major chest surgery for a lung cancer. Or they just coughed up blood because they've got a stomach ulcer or something. You can't give blood thinners right away. You put in, a, in a, uh, an IVC filter. There are lots of situations where we don't know if filters are needed or not, but people get them. So if we're going to dissolve a blood clot in a leg, which I'm going to talk to you about in a second, 
Do you need a blood uh, filter put in to catch a piece of the blood clot while you're dissolving it? Or if you have a big blood clot in a vein or leg that looks like it's moving a little bit at the top, is that someone who needs a filter? We just don't know. We don't know. But you can see here that the rate of placing filters in the United States is astronomically rising. Look at this. These are these removable filters. So if everybody who got one of these removable filters had them put in and pulled out for the right reason, you'd say, OK. But the fact is, only a third of these filters are ever removed. So they're put in because they think you need one. The advantage is it can be pulled out, but then it doesn't get pulled out. And bad things can happen. So now, I'm going to teach you how to read a CAT scan. This is easy. This is really easy. But let me tell you, I'm no x-ray radiologist. This is the spine. This is the belly wall. So you're laying on the table like this, right? This is your back. This is your belly. This is your aorta, big artery in the belly. See this thing right here? That's the top of one of those filters, OK? You're looking through a slice. See these two stripes here? Where the heck are they? The vein that's in here is right here. These have penetrated that vein wall and are sticking something else that shouldn't be stuck. That's pretty worrisome. Or they can break. Look at this one. Here's a filter where they're missing one piece broke off. And look, the sixth leg is still inside the body. So you can see, sometimes you need these filters, right? If you, can't, if you have a new blood clot and you can't get your blood thinned, you need a filter. But not everybody needs a filter, and they're not always safe. So now I'm going to talk to you about two of my patients, all right? 26-year-old, lovely young woman who's got no past medical history at all and just takes the birth control pill. She lives here in Boston. Her boyfriend lives in Northern Virginia. And every Friday after work, she gets on a bus. And she goes to Northern Virginia to spend the weekend with her boyfriend. And every Sunday night, she gets on the bus and comes back. And she's been doing this a long time, weekend after weekend. One time, she goes for 10 hours to see her fiance. And after 24 hours, on Saturday, ready to go out for dinner, she gets sudden onset of pain in the chest. She gets a little shortness of breath. It gets worse. She can't get on the bus Sunday night because she can hardly breathe. She goes to a local hospital. Her only complaint is, my chest wall hurts when I take a deep breath, and I feel a little winded. But otherwise, I'm fine. And on exam, her blood pressure is fine. The amount of oxygen in her blood is perfect. She's just got pain. She's got a blood clot on the right side of her lung, OK? So in my view, and I suspect in Dr. Ansel's view as well, we would treat somebody like this with blood thinners and follow them. But in this case, for reasons that to this day I can't explain to you, they did put her on blood thinners, but they also put in one of these filters. I don't know why. She went home on the shots of Lovenox and Warfarin, and she was sent to me to take care of her now that she lives in Boston, right? She was, had this in Northern Virginia. Someone's got to take care of her. So I see her and I say, I'm happy to take care of you, but I don't know why they put that filter in. So I call the doctor in Northern Virginia and I say, hey, why'd you put that filter? And they said, well, we thought it'd be safer. This woman had no risk of bleeding. She was totally healthy, 26 years old. Here's her, this is, a, this is an injection of contrast into the big vein in the belly. This is the filter. The tip is sticking outside the vein here. This leg is already outside the vein. And look at all of these. I mean, this is a disaster. This is her CAT scan. And look what happened when we took this out. This is actually tissue from her own body. She didn't need this filter in the first place. She's doing great, by the way. And they're married now. And she just called me last week, and she's pregnant. So now I've got to deal with managing her pregnancy with all this. But now, there are ways to, uh, five minutes? OK. Um, there are ways to dissolve blood clots. We've got all these devices that can uh, dissolve blood clots. And we can get big pieces of blood clots out. Look at this. This is not like a worm sitting there. That's actually what a blood clot looks like. This is, this is big time stuff. But this is somebody who was dying. I mean, they were literally dying, and we didn't have time to use blood thinners and all this other stuff. 
So now I'm going to wrap it up with a final story. This is one of the saddest cases I've ever had, but it tells the story that Dr. Ansel said, and we didn't even talk beforehand. This is a 44-year-old attorney who's a big-time athlete, plays rugby, does triathletes, all that stuff. And he hurt his left foot, and it hurt, it kept him from competing. And so he went to a foot doctor who said, you need an operation to fix the bone in your foot. So he has this foot operation done. He's given a cast, a cast that goes up to the knee, and he's only wearing it for two weeks. And at the end of two weeks, he calls the foot doctor and says, my leg feels tight in the cast. So the doctor brings him in and removes the cast, and his leg looks swollen. So he calls me and says, hey, you know, could this be a blood clot? And I say, well, send him right over. Let's figure it out. He otherwise feels completely well. So the bottom line is, this is what his leg looked like. I wouldn't say it's terribly swollen, right? Here's the bandage from the foot surgery. But he, 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 it felt uncomfortable. This is the ultrasound that Dr. Ansel showed you. The blood uh, in these veins is not flowing. These are veins in the calf only. So kind of middle of the calf on the operated leg. So he's got a blood clot. So what would you do now? Well, there are several things you could do. I offered him what I thought was the right thing to do, which would be to start blood thinners. Why would a healthy athlete who had foot surgery and a cast for only two weeks develop a blood clot? I said, you ought to be on blood thinners. That's what I told him. And he said, I don't really want to do that. I don't want to get involved with all this headache of shots and worrying about what I'm eating, and I like to compete, and I'm going to start to train again. So I don't want to do that. So I said, OK, since your blood clot's only in the calf, the risk of that breaking off and going to the lungs is so low that we'll just see you on a regular basis to do ultrasounds to make sure the clot's not growing. So that's what we did. Two days later, he comes in for his ultrasound, and it shows the blood clot's exactly in the same place that it was two days before. And in fact, his leg's feeling a little better. So I said, OK, four days from now, we'll do another ultrasound. The day before his other ultrasound, he wakes up in the middle of the night with pain in his chest otherwise feeling fine, and his leg is now totally perfect. This is his blood clot. So he developed the blood clot from this vein in the calf to the lungs. Very unusual. So I think to myself, something is not right here. This was not the foot surgery, because a healthy young athlete should not get a blood clot to the lungs from a little vein clot in the calf. Unbelievable. What else? This. This guy's never smoked a day in his life. This was cancer, 44 years old. So remember what Dr. Ansel said. If you get a blood clot for no reason, you can't explain it. You've got to think that this might be a marker of something bad to come. So the take home message, DVT and PE, these blood clots in the veins and legs can be prevented. Know what your risks are, and you treat those risks. Know the symptoms of a blood clot like we talked about. There are lots of exciting treatments that are available. Ask your doctor. It's always a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the National Blood Clot Alliance for the invitation. Thank you so much, Dr. Jack. So we'll take two very short questions. Up in the back, I saw the first hand. Hi, we're live tweeting, and I have a question from the internet. Um, it was really probably for Dr. Ansel, but I'll ask if you know the answer. Um, I tweeted about the risks for Leiden 5, and somebody asked if we know the risks for Factor 2. Uh, for I passing don't, down to children. I, I don't actually know the risks okay. for Factor that's 2. Okay, I'll, I'll tell him. Sorry. I don't mean to put, be the That's okay. The I'm, there's the plenty of things I don't know the answers to. Just ask my kids. Yes, uh, I have a question. I have a recurrence of a blood clot, but uh, there, there was no reason explaining why I had the, uh, the clot, because the only thing that I sit a lot. And I've been uh, in um, warfare for at least 
I would say two years. What would you suggest? So just like Dr. Ansel, you and I just met. It's not like we've been working behind the scenes here. Um, I can't give you good medical advice, but I would tell you this, a couple of basic rules. All things being equal, if you have a new blood clot after a first one and no one can figure out why, that's one of those situations where I think you're on blood thinners for a long time. Now, I would tell you that 10 years ago, we didn't even know what factor V Leiden was, right? We had never heard about prothrombin gene mutation. Look what we've learned. We're going to continue to learn about new risk factors for blood clotting. So it might very well be that what you have might turn up over the course of the next several years. But I would say you're on blood thinners for a longer period of time, and you and your doctor have to be very closely joined at the hip to make sure that you're medically healthy going forward so that nothing else turns up. 